President, at some point today or tomorrow, the Senate will hastily consider and likely pass a massive hodgepodge spending bill to fund every last department and program within our federal government. Even those programs and those departments that we know don't work, even those programs and those departments where we know that there's a lot of abuse and misuse of sacred federal funds. The alternative, if you can call it even an alternative at all, and the only alternative is to deny funding for every last department and every last program within the federal government. Even those programs and those departments that we know are absolutely essential. All or nothing. Those are our only options. The only options we're given. We have no other choice made available to us. This is government on autopilot, or alternatively, government without an engine. The problem, Mr. President, is that by funding the federal government through a massive patchwork spending bill, we force the American people to choose between two equally bad, two equally unacceptable options. Pay for everything in government or pay for nothing at all. Either fund the entire federal government tomorrow at exactly the same level that we're funding it today or fund nothing within the federal government, not even to pay our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our Marines, our judges, or not even to provide care for our veterans or support for the most vulnerable among us. This kind of all or nothing proposition is dysfunctional. It's anti-democratic. And it prevents Congress from doing its job, which I remind my colleagues is to re represent the American people and to be faithful stewards of their money, of the taxpayer money with which they have entrusted their Congress. During the month of August, I held a long series of town hall meetings across my state, the great state of Utah. Whether I was in Cache County in the north end of the state or in Washington County in the opposite direction or somewhere in between, the people of Utah, Democrats and Republicans alike, were clear about what they wanted. They were clear about the fact that they were demanding action. They wanted action in Washington. Their concerns weren't always the same. Some worried most about public lands. Others were anxious about the economy. And many, of course, were troubled by the growing crisis along our southern border. But they were all looking for answers. They were all looking for solutions from someone. Everywhere I went, they asked me, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to get our economy back on track? What are you going to do to deal with many of the problems within our federal government that seem to go unaddressed for far too long? And I would tell them, as a matter of law and by operation of our Constitution, members of Congress have certain tools to address all of these concerns. But none of these powers is greater than the power of the purse. This is the power to allocate money to fund the government to fund its operations. It's what enables Congress, and only Congress, to reform dysfunctional government. Impassioned within, in, in, encompassed within the power to give money is the power necessarily to withhold money. In this case, the power of the purse is the most potent and the most effective instrument Congress can use to hold the executive branch accountable. So when the administration fails to follow the law, as our current administration has done so freely and so frequently, Congress can demand answers and accountability by using the power of the purse as leverage. As several of these town hall conversations continued, uh, in the course of those town hall conversations, I began to notice that at this point in my answer, Many people began to look hopeful, hoping that perhaps something could actually get done in Washington, hoping that perhaps some of the problems within our federal government could be corrected, could be reined in, could be turned around and set on a better course. 
but then I'd have to break the bad news. And here's the bad news. I'd, I'd have to tell them that all those things that their representatives should be able to do and have an obligation to do, like, for example, fixing broken government programs, ensuring the solvency of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and impeding lawless actions by the executive branch, simply cannot get done because the Democratic leadership in the Senate insists that our federal government operate on autopilot. This is the problem with the continuing resolution. When Congress has only one opportunity to exercise its power of the purse by voting for or against an all-or-nothing spending package, an all-inclusive, all-or-nothing spending bill, Congress has essentially no opportunity to exercise its power of the purse, at least not in a meaningful way, at least not in a way that enables Congress to demand accountability from government. In the continuing resolution we'll consider tomorrow, there are several provisions that deserve their own consideration and debate, such as reauthorizing the Import-Export Bank, extending the Internet Tax Freedom Act, and authorizing military action in Syria. None of these measures, and certainly not something that could put American lives at risk, should be hurried through on an all-or-nothing vote. This is why the CR matters for everyone in this country. It is the principal reason our government is so dysfunctional and so unaccountable. A government on autopilot leaves Congress effectively paralyzed, powerless to implement meaningful government reforms, and powerless to hold the president and the president's administration accountable for their actions. This, Mr. President, is not, is not how government is supposed to operate. This, Mr. President, is not how this government is ever supposed to be allowed to operate. It doesn't have to be this way. There is a better way. Indeed, as you can see in this chart, until just a few years ago, the better way was the only way. The House, as you can see here, uh, uh, has done this and is still doing it today. So uh, let, let me explain what this, this demonstrates right here. Freestanding appropriations bills that were passed by the Congress for fiscal year 2006. We had 11, 11 separate individualized freestanding appropriations bills. We had 11. Now, to put that in context, that's more freestanding independent appropriations bills than Congress has enacted in all of the fiscal years ever since then, just in one year. That, of course, used to be the norm. It no longer is. In fact, lately, we're not doing any of these things. Now, it is important to point out that the House of Representatives still routinely passes freestanding appropriations measures. For fiscal year 15, uh, the, the upcoming fiscal year, fiscal year 2015, the House of Representatives has passed seven such bills. The Senate has passed zero. Not only has the Senate passed none of its own freestanding appropriations bills, it has refused to pass. In fact, it has refused even to vote on any of the seven appropriations bills passed by the House of Representatives. The fact is, Mr. President, that before the Democratic leadership took control of the Senate, Congress would spend most of its time during the spring and summer of each year discussing, debating, amending, and eventually figuring out how much taxpayer money to spend and on what. Congress would consider separate spending bills one by one, individually. Each of these bills would allocate a certain amount of money to fund the departments, the agencies, and the programs within a certain area of government, organized by government function, like defense or transportation, or homeland security, or health care. And each spending bill originated in one of the corresponding subcommittees in the House 
and in the Senate. This, Mr. President, is what we call the appropriations process. And it made sense that it would take up most of our time, because as members of Congress, we have a solemn obligation to represent the people and to be faithful stewards of taxpayer money, of the money that many Americans spend many months of their lives each year just to earn so that they can send it to Washington, D.C. The American taxpayer deserves better. The American taxpayer should be able to expect more out of Congress. Instead, they've come to expect so much less. But that's how Congress used to operate, according to its own rules, according to historical precedent. And more to the point, according to basic principles of common sense. But alas, times have changed. What Congress used to deliberate on for months, we now rush through in a single afternoon without opportunity for amendment, without opportunity for a full debate. What used to be the subject of open and robust debate is now trivialized and treated as a mere formality, as a mere technical requirement to be dispensed with and discarded as quickly as it arrives. Mr. President, the American people deserve better. Indeed, as I discovered while visiting with people from one corner of Utah to the other, the American people demand that we do better. I think we can do better. In fact, I know that we can. We have in the past, and we will in the future, but we have got to get the regular order appropriations process back on track. We need to dispense once and for all with this mindset that says, we're gonna fund the government with one bill. You're gonna have one opportunity to, to vote on any and all matters relating to the funding of the federal government. It's a binary choice. You fund everything at current levels or you fund nothing. You keep it running just the way it is with no opportunity for meaningful reform or you don't fund anything at all and you accept all of the heartache and all the difficulty that goes along with this. This is wrong. It violates our laws, it violates our procedures, it violates common sense. We as a Congress have asked the American people over and over and over again to expect less. I'm here to tell each of my colleagues that it's time for the American people not to expect less, it's time for the American people to expect more. They are expecting more, they are expecting freedom, they are expecting for us to honor them by debating and discussing and voting on how we're going to spend their money. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.